Hey everybody, so today I want to talk about watches, and I want to talk specifically about a watch that I've owned for about two and a half months now, which is the Omega Seamaster 300. This is the new reference version. I, <laughs> When I flip the camera, I'll give you the reference version. I don't remember it offhand. It's like this long, so it's very big. But anyways, the 2018 version with the new laser cut wave dial and ceramic and all of that kind of stuff. I've got it on a rubber strap today so that I can show you the back of the watch um, more easily. On the bracelet, you can't see it, but it comes with this lovely steel bracelet, and I'll, of course, show close-ups and so forth as we go. If you want to see more about all of the watches that I own and uh, think about the question of is an expensive watch worth it because this is a very expensive watch, no question about that, then you should watch the video on my sister channel which is called Dr. Know-It-All. I will leave the link in the description and it's like a half hour video that goes through watches anywhere from like the $50 range up to you know the $5,000 range. So basically two orders of magnitude and what advantages do you get out of watches at the higher price versus the lower price and so forth so anyway if you want to watch that I highly encourage you again click the link maybe watch this video first then click the link in the description and you can go watch that one or else go watch that one first and then come back and watch this one which is a full review I did that one before I'd had a chance to really wear this watch for a long time so hopefully you can get uh, a sense about why one would go to the trouble of purchasing an expensive watch versus just getting a, a cheap Casio or something like that so what do I want to do today? What I want to do is give a full review of the watch. Like I said, I've owned it for about two and a half months, so I've worn it almost every day in that time, and I've really had a chance to think about it and come to interact with it. I've learned the good, the bad, the ugly, and so forth, all the, all of the stuff about it. Um, so I think I can give a good solid review, and then I want to talk about how the watch could be utilized in different conditions. For example, uh, the kind of classic set of four watches, the, the dive watch, the casual watch, the complication watch, and the dress watch. So I'll talk about that in the second half of the video. The first half will be more of a review of all of the specifications and then my thoughts on the good and the bad of the watch itself after having worn it for this amount of time. So anyway, I hope this is useful and uh, without more ado, let's flip the camera, get around and look at the watch itself. All right, so let's take a look at this Omega Seamaster 300. Uh, first, I suppose I should do a quick wristwatch check. <laughs> I'm not wearing the Omega Seamaster because I'm reviewing it. I'm wearing a Zelos Swordfish, which I will actually use. This is on a leather strap. I'll use that as a kind of a reference at some points for uh, how the Seamaster is a little bit different since they're both ostensibly diver watches. Okay, the first thing we'll do is we'll go over the specs on this guy. Uh, the first one is the reference number, and I don't know what's up with Omega and their reference numbers, but it's 210.30.42.20.01.001. That's a mouthful. <laughs> so anyway, I'll put all this information in the description so that you can just uh, check it really quickly. Also, forgive my puppy. Um, we have a new puppy in the house. So if she's yawning and making noise, forgive that during the review. Um, okay. So in terms of what makes up this watch there, you can see it's a caliber 8,800, which is a free sprung coaxial movement, completely in-house design. There's a three quarter bridge there and you can see the balance bridge right there. Uh, it has two certifications. It has COSC certification, which is common for Swiss, wa Swiss watches. And it also has METAS certification, which is something that Omega has sort of cooked up with the meteorology um, standards. I can't remember what it's called in French, but something in French that has to do with meteorology. And they basically have an, their own standards, which um, has a lot to do with the uh, master chronometer um, certification down there. You can see if we look at it again, I'll throw in some, uh, macro really close up macro shots. So you can see this, this is currently on a rubber strap, which is not an Omega strap. The reason why is because I wanted to be able to show off this lovely back, which is a sapphire coated crystal. I mean, excuse me. It's a sapphire crystal. <laughs> the front has anti-reflective coating. I don't believe the back does, but anyway, uh, so that you can see the lovely movement underneath it and also some specifications. This is a 300 meter diver, which actually means that for the certification testing, it was tested to 375 meters. This individual watch was, so every single watch was tested. I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, this was also tested for master chronometer certification, which again is down there. You can see 
there's a master chronometer certification, which means it had to be between zero and plus five seconds per day. This individual watch tested to 3.5 seconds per day. And uh, <laughs> damn, if that's not accurate, that's exactly what it runs at pretty much every day. This movement also features completely amagnetic materials, which means that the balance spring is um, silicon and the other components that are critical to the timekeeping are also amagnetic up to 15,000 gauss, which apparently is somewhere around the, uh, <laughs> the uh, magnetic field of an MRI machine. So you should pretty much never have to worry about your watch being magnetized or anything like that. The watch is automatic, hacking, and hand winding, so that's just kind of good basic stuff. It is also a coaxial movement, which is completely unique to Omega. Um, watchmaker George Daniels in the 1970s came up with the idea for a different type of movement as opposed to the traditional Swiss lever escapement movement, and he worked on that for years, and Omega ended up uh, continuing the work and they have uh, obviously commercially produced this product, which is pretty fantastic. So it's an entirely different and um, more long lasting movement than traditional movements are. Also, all aspects of this watch are tested individually. And interestingly enough, you can put in the serial number of the watch and you can actually find out what your watch did in terms of testing, which is pretty cool. That's kind of fun stuff to have with the modern world. Okay, as for the dimensions and so forth, the width is 42 millimeters, or the diameter if you want to put it that way. The lug to lug, which is these two guys here, is 47 millimeters. The height, this direction, is 14 millimeters. The lug width is 20 millimeters, which, uh, well, I'll get into it later, but that, that's an interesting aspect of it. The weight of this watch with the steel bracelet, notice I don't have that on right now because I'm trying to show off the back of this, but anyway, with the steel bracelet, the weight is 191 grams, which is a pretty hefty watch for sure. Uh, the head of the watch all by itself, just this part is 84 grams, and on a lightweight rubber strap like this, it's a mere 98 grams. So actually, the, uh, the steel bracelet makes it a substantially heavier watch. So if you want just a light watch that, you know, is easy to move around and so forth, this is definitely it. Although it does tend to weigh a little bit more on the head if it's got a lighter uh, bracelet like this, but it's really not that big a deal. It feels, feels very comfortable in any case. Um, this watch, on the other hand, is a little bit more hefty, and it, it definitely feels a little top-heavy sometimes. So just as a comparison. All right, again, the case back here is a clear sapphire, which shows the movement off. Uh, unfortunately, because of the three-quarter uh, back plate here, you can't really see that much. You can see the bridge, and you can see the movement, which is very cool. And, of course, you can see how pretty the finishing is. It's a very, very beautiful finishing on it, so that's nice. The bracelet and the case are both uh, stainless steel, uh, 316L maybe, I don't know. <laughs> don't know which kind it is, but it's definitely a stainless steel, so it should, you know, it could get scratched up over time, but it will definitely not lose its luster or get tarnished or anything like that, so that's lovely. The face is a zirconium dioxide, which is a type of ceramic, and it's very difficult to see indoors. You can kind of see the wave pattern and so forth, but outside in the sunlight, it is just smashing. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things I look at my watch outside and I, I kind of want to stop on the street and just kind of stare at it, and it's very embarrassing, actually. <laughs> it's a little bit weird and funky. But anyway, I'll put in some shots of it outdoors. It's very, very beautiful. There are many other colors to this watch. This is a black on black, of course. You can get a blue color, which is beautiful. You can get a gray. Gosh, there's precious metals. There's all sorts of things. So you can look on Omega's website if you want to like get a rundown of different ty types of models of this. But you know, again, generally speaking, they're all the same basic idea. They just have different um, either face and bezel colors or even potentially precious metals and so forth that they're made out of. The bezel is a ceramic, and I believe this is now an enamel. This is the 2018 model. The older model had liquid metal in here for the new numbers and for the, the little marks, but I believe this is now a white-ish enamel. So it's a slightly different look. It's a very, very pretty. It's absolutely beautiful. It should be completely robust and should last forever, <laughs> essentially. The crystal is a very, very slightly domed sapphire crystal with anti-reflective coating inside and out, which is lovely. 
And of course, it's a dive watch. It has a screw down crown, which hacks and hand winds and so forth. It has a date complication at the six o'clock position. I really appreciate the six o'clock position. It's very balanced and so forth. Obviously it has a helium escape valve, which is a, a divisive item for many, many people with this particular watch. It also has a, a unidirectional 120 click rotating bezel so you can actually turn it. Uh, notice the different kind of grip. It's not the standard coin edge that you would see with most things. Again, just as a comparison, this guy has more of a, it's not really coin edge, but it has more of a side grip, so you would pick it up. Very, this is much, much harder to spin this one. So there you go. This one has a really nice movement and so forth. But anyway, but it doesn't have the hard grippy stuff that you would get on the edge. Okay, it also has a power reserve of 55 hours, which was tested when it was certified, and I recently tested it too. I left it alone for about 50 hours, and it was still running perfectly fine, so there you go. And of course, it has a depth rating, since it's a dive watch, of 300 meters, which means that this individual watch was tested to 25% more than that, which is about 375 meters. So it's a that's a big honker of a watch. <laughs> it can take much more depth than human beings can take, so there you go. Okay, on to the good and the bad on this watch. We will start with the good. Um, the movement is really fantastic. <laughs> if you're a watch geek, you're going to completely geek out about the movement. But even if you're not, you basically don't have to service this, you know, at least 10 years before you have to service it. So that's a fantastic thing. The, uh, the testing results for your own watch are also pretty cool for watch geeks. That means you can actually go online and you can look at how your, you know, this particular watch did, this serial number did, which is pretty cool. Uh, 42 millimeters is a pretty nice size for a dive watch. This is up slightly. I believe that the old version, with ha which had the flat face, um, was 41 millimeters. So it's just a hair bigger than the old one was. And it's also not too tall for a dive watch. Considering the, uh, the original coaxial movements were pretty thick, this is, this is nice that they've actually got this down to not a terribly um, uh, tall watch anymore. So that's not bad. It makes it much more versatile because it can fit underneath cuffs and so forth, at least if you have a relatively generous cuff on a, on a long sleeve shirt. Um, <laughs> the helium escape valve is completely useless for any kind of normal use cases. I mean... The only people who would use a helium escape valve are um, uh, saturation divers, and saturation divers are at least going to get the planet ocean kind of, or the Rolex Sea Dweller or something like that. They're going to be up a level from this. They're not going to be purchasing this watch. So it's basically useless, but I actually kind of like it. It's, it's kind of cool. It gives it some character. It's different than the standard watch, so that's kind of fun. And, you know, <laughs> I guess it's a conversation starter if you want to talk to anybody about that. Onto the face. The face is, again, it just doesn't show it well enough in this kind of light, but you can start to see. I mean, look at that face. It's absolutely beautiful. Again, it's a ceramic material. It's very, very, ZRO2 is like very, very uh, finely printed on there in dark, which I believe is zirconium dioxide. Um, and it's just beautiful. It has such a luster. It stops me dead on the street between that and the hands and so forth. I just think it's fantastic. Um, the laser cut waves. You kind of, again, you may not be able to get quite the impression of it on a video, but in person, they are just stunning. It's just beautiful. Uh, I love the positioning of the date window down here. Um, I'll return to that in a moment because there are some negatives to that too. But the position is very balanced with the double battens at the top, which is quite beautiful. And also the shape of the markers around the dial. Very, very attractive. <laughs> it looks beautiful. Um, and also the red the subtle touch of red on the Seamaster and also on the second hand at the extension of it is quite beautiful it adds a really lovely touch and just a little bit of color and you notice that the uh, this is an inexpensive watch band but uh, I got it with red stitching because I thought that was really cool to have it kind of match the um, the little touches the accents on the watch itself the hands. So I wasn't convinced by the hands at first about the skeletonized hands, but actually I've owned this watch for about two and a half months now, and I really actually have come to like it. There's kind of a negative space aspect to it, and you can sort of see through them. And also there's a lot of attention to detail. If you notice, as the second hand goes around, it just kisses. See that? The hour hand. And now as it comes around, the, the 
on this will also just kiss the triangle. So you can see that a lot of attention was, was given over to exactly how these elements interact. So watch this, it goes around and it just kisses the triangle as it goes around. So that's super cool. Um, also love the fact that this is a triangle and this is a triangle so that the, the pip, the marker, the registration marker and the minute hand, which are the most important things for diving, have kind of a matching geometry to them so that you've got the triangles. It's also sets it apart from the second hand and the hour hand, which are both circles on the end. So you can really easily see it. So I, I've actually really come to appreciate and enjoy the seconds and hour hands and so forth. Uh, it's very distinct, even in the dark. The loom on the, on the face and the loom on the hands are quite beautiful. There's kind of this pale blue white color, except for the minute hand and the pip. Um, the registration pip, both of those are kind of a greenish color. So it sets them off again so that there's this kind of subtle differentiation. I'm going to get back to this pip on the bad. <laughs> so hold on to that thought for a moment. Uh, the red tip of the second hand and the lollipop also give it kind of a hearkening back to the um, 1950s original Seamaster versions, which had a big lollipop second hand, which was very cool. So that's a, that's a pleasure for the watch geeks again. And again, notice how it just kisses all of these markers as it goes around the outside. So again, just like really cool how the, how the second hand kind of like walks the whole thing around. The bezel. So the bezel is ceramic. It has a beautiful luster. It should stay like that for about forever. So this is much, much tougher than the older aluminum bezels. It's kind of common now, of course, Rolex. And um, even honestly, this, uh, this Delos has a ceramic bezel but this one is particularly beautiful it's very shiny it's very lustry it's so so lovely um the bezel edge is not ideal for gripping but you kind of press down instead of gripping sideways you press down and it this the action is just beautiful and also um the registration is beautiful let's see if i can <laughs> there we go the registration is beautiful and it, this this shape as opposed to the coin edge gives it more versatility which again i will get to in the next section of this video so i think it has uh, a really nice aspect to it. it. It's a little bit of a disappointment in terms of like, I guess if you were diving with wet hands and gloves, but I've actually used this for diving and it worked. So it was okay. Um, surprisingly enough, it was not as bad. Now I was diving in the tropics. So, you know, I didn't have to have gloves and heavy stuff. If I did, I probably would want something with a little more grip to it, but it worked very well for, for what I was doing. Uh, I also like the fact that the registration mark is a triangle. It makes it very obvious, but again, I will get back to that on the negative. Okay, so the bracelet. Again, I will show some pictures since I don't have that on the watch right now. The bracelet is just amazing. The micro adjustment on the back of it just rocks. It's, it's such a cool micro adjustment. Uh, I'll throw in some insert pictures of what that looks like adjusting it. And also the diver's extension works very well. Uh, it was funny that the guy that the salesman was telling me there was no diver's extension on the watch and I popped it open and said, uh, yes, there is. So <laughs> just goes to show a lot of times these people who work at these stores don't really know everything about a watch. Um, again, this is a relatively new watch, the model and so forth, but anyway, but the micro adjust by itself, I've used a ton of times because it's really nice to be able to adjust for your, I have a seven and a half inch wrist and as the weather gets warmer or colder, it shrinks and goes back. And, you know, so anyway, it's just nice to be able to adjust it as you go. Um, I have used the Rolex micro adjustment in the store, but I've never obviously owned a Rolex, so I don't know how that would work day to day, but certainly I feel like the Omega is on par with that. So that's really nice. The styling of the bracelet, while it's similar to the original GoldenEye, James Bond, Pierce Brosnan version um, from the early 90s, it is more of a hard edge. The polishing is not quite as rounded and so forth, so it gives it a much more modern look. The, 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 it's amazing how subtle the difference is between the two bracelets, but the, this modern bracelet looks modern and the old one looks like 25 years old. It looks like a kind of a vintage look from the 90s. And so I really, really prefer the harder edge of the Jubilee bracelet. That's, it's kind of a, a, a nice, I guess it's Jubilee. I don't know. <laughs> it's not your standard three, um, three link bracelet across. And even though I really actually love those kind and this style is not my absolute favorite style, I actually really love it because it's a very versatile bracelet. So I think that that's really cool. As far as weight is concerned, on the steel bracelet, even though it's a very heavy watch in the steel bracelet, it's perfectly balanced top and bottom. It feels like it wears just beautifully like a dream. So I find it to be very versatile in terms of what kind of strap you can wear with it. I don't have a NATO strap yet. I have a leather and a rubber strap. I would probably going to get a NATO strap eventually because it's just really cool to be able to sort of dress it down and so forth. 
Uh, I'm not uh, spending the money to buy the Omega branded versions of these things. You know, this this watch band was very inexpensive. But again, I just think it looks nice. It kind of dresses it down and it also makes it a little more of a stealthy watch. So that can be nice too, that you can wear it without it being obvious, you know, if you're going someplace where you're not absolutely convinced that it might not get stolen or something. You can uh, put it on one of these straps and it just looks a little more low key and so forth. Okay, and now the bad. So there's always bad with the watch, right? <laughs> so um, the first bad is a, probably an aesthetic decision, but I feel like it might be a bit too flashy for a diver. It's If you look at this versus the Rolex Submariner, which is you know sort of the benchmark, I guess, for a dive watch, and I'll probably try to throw up like some graphics of one versus the other here, but you can see that this is a more flashy looking watch. The dial is more flashy. The, the way that it's polished, there's, you know, the beautiful twisted liar lugs, which Omega is famous for, has a smooth polish on them. So it just creates a little more flash, and the bracelet is very, very flashy when you put it on that. So... It definitely has a little more flash to it, so maybe not quite as much the, you know, quote unquote tool watch and so forth, but it does make it more versatile. So we're going to talk about that in the second half of the video. The second thing I've already mentioned, which is the outside of the bezel is a little bit sad for gripping, but again, because the movement is so beautiful, oh, it just feels so good. <laughs> I like to turn it because it just feels so good to turn it. But because that, and because I just have sort of reoriented it where what you do is instead of gripping it, you push down a little bit and it just turns very, very easily. So I don't mind that so much. At the beginning, I was very upset by that, but I've decided that that's not as big a negative as I thought to. So, you know, it's not too bad. Uh, again, you probably, if you were diving in cold water with heavy gloves, you would not want to use this watch. But, you know, then again, you probably wouldn't want to use this watch then. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it has its own thing. The bezel definitely brings its own unique look to this. It doesn't look like any kind of Submariner ripoff or anything like that because it's not using the coin edge and the bezel. So I think that that's a positive too. So, you know, you've got a little bit of a negative. It's harder to grip. But the positive is it definitely gives this watch its own characteristics, which is really lovely. The loom. Um, just a small thing, but I find that the loom kind of disappears a little bit too quickly for my taste. Um, and that's rather unfortunate. It's just beautiful looking loom. It's this pale sort of bluish white color, except for again, the minute hand and the registration pip over here, which are both a, more of a pale green, but they look just smashing and I kind of want to stare at them for hours. Speaking of loom, the loom on the registration pip is just abysmal. This is actually the worst aspect of this watch in my mind. I don't know what they were thinking. This pip is way too small. It doesn't have enough loom in it and it disappears almost immediately and you can't see it in the dark. And essentially that just makes the watch useless to use as something like a diver or a timer at night. As a very simple thing, they could have just taken this entire triangle and filled in the whole thing with loom as opposed to just having that tiny, tiny little pip there or, or something they could have put like maybe the minute markers could have been loomed. Um, you know, this Zelos watch here, just to put this down for a second, these guys like the whole, whole thing is loomed, which is really, really cool looking at night. Um, <clears throat> and so it's kind of sad. I, again, I, for aesthetic reasons and for longevity reasons and so forth, I can understand them not doing this, but there is no excuse for not getting this pip better. That that's just, it's just abysmal. And honestly, it's the reason, only reason why I would even think about selling this watch and getting something else was because of this loom, it, this pip, it's, it's just that bad. Uh, and I don't know, maybe, maybe that's just me. Maybe it's the way I use it. Maybe it's cause I'm imagining going from black water diving somewhere or something like that, but that really, really bugs me. Okay. Another thing that's a, a problematic area is uh, I love the fact that the date window's at six o'clock and I understand why they made it this size because it matches the marker size, but it's too bloody small. Um, it's very, very difficult to read this in low light. It's easy enough in the sun, no problem, but in, in, you know, in low light or if you're at a weird angle like this, it's just hard to see. And if, especially as you get up into the 20s, like 25 or something like that, that's a lot of information to put in this tiny little window. When it's just one digit, when it's like an eight or something, it's pretty easy to see, but two digits is very, very difficult. Um, I think one solution obviously would have been to make this bigger. Ironically, I think a Cyclops like Rolex has would actually be really, really useful on this watch, but I really hate Cyclopses, so 
Don't do that, Omega. <laughs> you could have made this bigger. Uh, another option would have honestly been to loom these numbers, right? Just a little bit of loom on them would have meant like if you kind of cover it up like that, that you would be able to see the, the numbers kind of glowing, which would be super cool. And how unique would that be to have a glowing date? That, that would be awesome. <laughs> so next round, Omega, you should do that for sure. And finally on this, the positioning of the crowns. Um, I... I find it annoying that they're offset like this. I, I wish that, you know, if they're going to have the helium escape valve, which again, I don't mind that much, why would they not have put the, the screw down crown, the main crown at four o'clock here, right? So it's split across this. That would have looked really, really cool. It also would take the crown out of the way of your wrists so that it wouldn't potentially hit your wrists, which would also be cool. I don't know. <laughs> I think that because they make a chronograph version also, that they have, you know, the, the pushers, the, the start, stop and reset pushers, like on the Speedmaster or something like that. Perhaps because they make that, they've decided that they don't really want to move the crown for this model and put it back in the middle for the others. But I do find it a little unfortunate that they're not somehow more symmetrical, considering especially that the, um, the date and the double battens window were made symmetrical. But, you know, <laughs> my thoughts, who knows, they had their own reasons, I'm sure. Speaking of the chronograph version, there is a beautiful kind of rose gold version. I'll throw up a picture of it online, but man, that is a, that's a pretty looking watch. It, it's a little bit more busy, but <laughs> I would take that watch in a heartbeat. So. All right, on to answering the question of the day. Is this the one watch to rule them all? And what I mean by that is, is this watch so versatile that you could have this as your only watch in your collection? So you just would have a one watch collection, just the Omega Seamaster, and that would do everything you needed and it would co cover all of the basics that most people would have in their watch collection. So I think that's an interesting question. So let's just consider this versus, again, the Zelo Swordfish. This is lovely, it's in bra uh, bronze. And you can see that it's got like a patina on it and so forth. This isn't that old, actually. It's just got a nice patina, so it's very lovely. But this is a pretty thick watch. This is a, you know, it's, it's tool-like. It's very solid. Excellent dive watch, you know, in terms of the look and so forth, but not very versatile. It's, you, you can't wear this to like some sort of fancy formal event that just doesn't look right at all. So it's not like that. So... Let's think about this for the kind of classic categories. There's the dive watch, number one, <laughs> and that's what this ostensibly is. So you've got that. It's, there's the casual watch, which is kind of the everyday beater watch. There's the complication watch, and there's the dress watch. Those are kind of the four big categories of watches. So let's look at this and think about how this works for each one of these. Okay, so compare this to a Rolex Submariner, which would be the kind of, again, the the benchmark of this category. The Submariner is much less dressy looking. It's much more restricted in terms of its styling, but it probably makes a better dive watch, better tool watch looking watch. Um, you know, this is great as a diver, but it's a little on the flashy side. And it's also, they've, they've sacrificed usability in terms of the bezel and rotation and so forth for the kind of look of it, right? So again, this is not quite as easy to grip as it could be. Again, <laughs> it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be, and I've grown to like it a lot, but it's not quite as tool watch as it could be. Um, and then, you know, again, the big problem, this guy right here, this pip. Like, what the hell were they thinking? That is abysmal. It's just so bad. And, the, and the, the loom on it is so bad. In the daylight hours, perfectly fine. No sweat at all. But at night, it's just not very useful. So uh, a, a good diver, a solid diver. I've worn it diving. It works perfectly well as a backup to my computer. All great. But it's not the perfect diver. Okay, on to the casual watch. So... Again, it's a bit flashy for a casual watch, but with a strap like this, or man, especially a NATO strap or something, I think this actually does pretty well as a casual watch. Um, again, a tad on the flashy side for that, but I think really that dresses it down. This, you know, this doesn't look that flashy with a, with a rubber strap on it, so it's, it, it tones it down quite a bit. So I think with a NATO especially, you could really dress this down and make it a, a good serviceable casual watch, something like that. 
All right, complication watch. So that is usually something like a chronograph, a stopwatch, something like that. So you might think to yourself, well, heck, this can't possibly do that. But, you know, again, it's got a date complication in it, which something like the Rolex Submariner no date does not have. So that's a good complication. And it also has a bezel, which I not only think could be useful, but actually have used. You know, you're not going to time it down to the second or something, but if you need to... Um, I don't know, boil your eggs for five minutes or something, right? You can easily set this guy and then look back at it. And at five minutes, you know, it's been five minutes. Now, again, it's not going to be down to the second accurate, but that's not a bad complication for this watch. So again, yeah, it's not too bad, right? <laughs> so it, you can also get a chronograph version of this watch if you so want, right? And that has two dials here. Again, I'll put a, a close up of another version of it somewhere. Um, that makes it a busier face. And I would say it makes it a little bit less dive watch -y, but it certainly ups the uh, complication factor. So you can definitely have a complication version of this watch. Now it is going to cost you more money too, especially if you get that beautiful rose gold version, <laughs> which <laughs> if somebody wants to buy me that as a present someday, I will take it. It's quite lovely. But anyway, I think it, it, even as this, it works pretty well as a complication watch, but certainly if you get like the chronograph version, it definitely does that for it. And finally, is this a dress watch? That's an interesting question. It seems like the biggest stretch for this kind of watch because this is a tool watch. It's more of a sporty watch. It's made out of stainless steel and not any kind of precious metals. But I actually think it does pretty well as a dress watch. Uh, again, it's not the thinnest movement in the world, but it's not that thick. At 14 millimeters, it's not that thick. It's got a lot of, it's got brushed polishing, but it also has a lot of smooth polishing. And the bezel is very flashy but it doesn't have too much on it, right? One of the big things about a dress watch is kind of minimalism. So it's got this kind of flash, it's got this heft, but it's also sort of minimal looking. Um, maybe the, you would prefer the one before this version that had the flat dial, but honestly, when I was purchasing this watch, I looked at the previous version, it was substantially less money, but I couldn't even begin to think about buying the, la the other version with this. <laughs> the, the two of them side by side, this dial is just, the face is so, so much better. It's just beautiful looking. Anyway, so, you know, a bit flashy, but I'll show you a picture of this on uh, an alligator leather strap that I have, and I think it looks really nice. Um, one problem with it is it's 42 millimeters, which makes it like, kind of big and a little unwieldy looking on the wrist. So the watch itself is quite lovely, but the thinness of the strap against the watch head underneath a cuff makes it look a little like like a big head or something. It's like a bobble head. Uh, it's just a tad, like if this was like 40 millimeters and was exactly the same and still had the 20 millimeter lug, to, lug width, it would be beautiful. Or alternatively, if they'd made this 22 millimeters instead, just a little bit bigger strap so it was a little more substantial on it, it would have worked better. Um, again, I don't know, you know, how do you do that with this twisted liar lugs? Because that's, you know, that's an Omega trademark. So they got themselves kind of stuck in terms of how big it could be. But I do think that either shrinking this down by two millimeters or increasing this by two millimeters, the, the lug width of, and, and having a larger strap would have made it almost a perfect dress watch. It, it would be really lovely. Certainly nowadays, you know, you don't need precious metals for a dress watch anymore. A stainless steel dress watch is very much, uh, you know, <laughs> fine. And, and that's all very cool. So anyway, it works, you know, because of the thickness, it works with a, with a generous cuff. It works great. Um, especially with like a short sleeve or underneath a suit jacket or something like that. It's very, very pretty in that terms. So my verdict, I think that weirdly enough, this watch does nothing perfectly. Even, even as a diver, it's not a perfect diver watch any, by any means, but it does all aspects of all watches pretty well. It does a diver pretty well. It does a casual pretty well. It does a, it does a complication pretty well. And it also does dress pretty well. So it's that, you know, it's that thing that, that does a lot of stuff pretty well. <laughs> and, and that's, um, that's very cool, which means that for your money, if you were only going to get one watch and you know, that's all you could get for the rest of your life. Yes, this actually would work very well. Now I'd want several different straps to go with it, but yeah, just the one watch head would be fantastic. It's also got an amazing and a long lasting movement, which does not need a lot of servicing, which is fantastic. 
The one thing I would say would be not to get this watch on Omega's rubber strap. It saves you a couple of hundred dollars not to get the steel bracelet strap, but watch straps are very inexpensive, and I would definitely say spring for the steel bracelet because it's the kind of signature thing that goes with this watch, and then purchase other straps and change them out as you need to. Okay, so my final thoughts on the subject. I'm back to wearing my <laughs> lovely Omega Seamaster now. Uh, it seems like Omega tried to make a very versatile watch, uh, including the bezel, the band, the face, etc., so that the watch would be usable in almost any condition. And lo and behold, it is usable in almost any condition. So it creates an amazingly versatile watch. It really can be used for any occasion that you want, from formal to very casual. And as a tool watch, as a diver, hell, I assume you could take this to space. It would probably work very well there, too. Um, as the saying goes, however, it, a jack of all trades, master of none, right? So this is like a really good watch under all circumstances, not a perfect watch under any circumstance. So it does everything very well, but nothing perfectly. So that is my verdict. It is not quite the one watch to rule them all because it doesn't do everything perfectly. But on the other hand, I am not a firm believer that there is such a thing as one watch to rule them all. I think that this actually comes about as close as you can come to being the one watch that rules them all in, you know, the real world. How's that? So that's my answer. Till next time. <laughs>